All right. Uh, so it seems it's uh, just me and you for now, Tree. I'll give it a couple of minutes. And uh, we'll see how this goes. Uh, hopefully more people showed up. It's no problem. It usually makes no difference. But anyways, uh, uh, can you check the stream? Uh, not this one, but uh, can you check the uh, YouTube stream? And uh, tell me how that looks. Or sounds or whatnot. Orlando, no. Orlando, uh, welcome. All right, thank you. For uh, anybody who's uh, got the stream open, uh, I'm not looking at any comments over there. So uh, if you want to uh, join this on Discord, where uh, I will be reading comments, uh, just uh, shoot me a message uh, on Twitter or DMs or whatnot. Uh, otherwise, uh, simply enjoy watching, I suppose. We'll just uh, give this a bit more, about four more minutes. And uh, we'll see how this goes. Uh, I told people to read the prefaces including the introductions, which is uh, actually a lot when you actually uh, see the amount of pages. Hmm. Uh, but uh, for those of you who, who did or did not, don't worry, because uh, we'll go through them anyways. Uh, I did say that I, I would prefer not to take too much time on these, more than uh, more sessions than necessary, but... Uh, you know, prefaces and introductions with Hegel are usually pretty good, actually. And if you're wondering why I'm uh, holding a microphone and I'm not uh, using a, a far more <laughs> comfortable device, it's because uh, my headset microphones and my laptop microphones are crap. So uh, we will make do with this. Uh, by the way, for those of you who can see, uh, I know a peop some, well, it seems a lot of people like to see the person while presentation's going on. Uh, I don't particularly care, but uh, if uh, you guys uh, prefer it or not, uh, let me know. All right, more people coming in. Welcome, everybody. Uh, yeah, we'll mainly be dealing with just uh, the uh, text. So uh, you should have the text, but in case you don't, well, I, I have the text here. Uh, it'll be on screen.
All right, it's 5 p.m. Uh, that was the uh, posted time, so uh, we will begin. Uh, welcome, everybody. About as many people showed up as I expected. Uh, <laughs> more than 100 people said they were interested, uh, but as is usual, few people ever show up. Uh, I understand uh, stuff happens, times, or issues, definitely. But uh, we'll make do. Uh, what we're going to do is basically, I'll have the text here on screen. And uh, I'll be reading basically uh, through it. I will comment on it as uh, I see fit. And uh, if anyone has any further comments to make or has questions to make, you can either ask in voice or you can ask in text chat. And uh, that'll be great. So everything looks fine. Here's a bit weird. <laughs> All right, there we go. Okay, The Science of Logic by Georg Wilhelm Friedrich Hegel. Volume 1, The Objective Logic, Book 1, The Doctrine of Being preface to the first edition and before we get to that uh, let me just make a bit of a preface of my own about this so whether you're all here to understand a little bit about Hegel curious obviously people are curious and whatnot uh, well I mean if you're hearing the voice you should be watching the stream here because it's uh, not delayed like the actual like the stream on YouTube but anyways um, let me just give you some uh, commentary on uh, who I am. I am Antonio Wolf. Uh, if you don't know me, that's perfectly fine. I am basically uh, just an enthusiast who kind of got uh, very caught up in uh, in the Hegel uh, about six years ago. <laughs> so it's been quite a while that I've, I've been into this, actually. Um, more so than the, the average person, I, I guess. Uh, I actually began my... Uh, I guess you you could probably call it a, properly the study of Hegel with a phenomenology of spirit, uh, like most of everybody else, I think, because uh, you're told that's where you begin. So I gave that a try, and uh, I didn't find it very, very intelligible. Uh, I found it very fascinating, but um, I didn't really understand very much of it. And uh, I spent about two years just kind of like roaming around the internet back around 2013, 14, well, from that time to about 2015. Uh, and uh, I had read many essays commenting on Hegelianism, commenting on the phenomenology, commenting on the logic, and I didn't find them very useful, didn't find them very helpful. And so then, uh, when was it? About 2015, 2016, uh, I actually encountered a group of people online who were interested in philosophy in general, as well as Hegel, just like I was. So... We tried some reading groups. We tried reading some uh, Kant first, the uh, Prolegomena, and uh, that didn't go well. We found out that the whole thing of uh, trying to tell people, read a chapter or read this much, and then we'll discuss it, you know, at some point uh, over text or voice, uh, didn't work out, mainly because people didn't read. And uh, even when they read, the texts... Are way too dense for anybody to like condense any like vague questions over like 20 pages of text for example uh, so then we tried it again with the science of logic and this time we decided that no we're not gonna like assign a certain amount of reading and then you know let's try to come together and like uh, make sense of it because it doesn't seem to work out uh, I've never seen that work in any group that I've joined I've joined groups with a uh, Grad students, I've joined groups with uh, undergrads. Uh, it doesn't seem to ever work. So uh, what we tried was what we're doing now, which is get together at a certain time, just 
have somebody read the text, have people uh, interject as they feel like they have questions or they want some clarifications or they have comments about it. Um, so that works out much, much better. Uh, there was much more engagement with that. Uh, there's a lot more information retention as well. Um, you find that you know as you're reading and listening and thinking about things and taking time to formulate questions as well as make commentaries and hear commentaries on things that you're going to retain information far better. So this is probably the best uh, learning exercise I've ever encountered uh, for this kind of stuff. Uh, another bit of it is that uh, the first time we read the Science of Logic, uh, it was sort of a crazy thing because uh, that was considered the most difficult work by Hegel. None of us had really gone through much Hegel before in a very systematic, rigorous way. Uh, so it was just kind of a really crazy experiment. And uh, what it turned out was that um, I was amazed uh, at how much easier the science of logic is compared to other texts by Hegel. Uh, much easier than the phenomenology spirit, much easier than any of the lectures that I've read, uh, mainly because everything that you read in the other lectures uh, relies on a certain kind of knowledge about the science of knowledge, not uh, science of logic. Not only in the sense that you need to have some kind of like knowledge of the concepts themselves, uh, but also mostly in the sense that you need to have a practice of how the thinking actually works for you to really grasp what Hegel is getting at. So hopefully working through this, uh, we can make it through to the end of chapter three. Uh, that is my hope. That is actually a big, <laughs> that, that's a big one. Um, when you actually like do it, you know, when you, if you actually just count the pages, it's not too bad. You think, oh, well, it's only about 150 pages, uh, you know, over like a month or two. That's not terrible. Uh, that's doable. Uh, but when you actually go line by line, the way we're going to do it, going through the kind of commentaries that we do, uh, it's going to be like a math exercise. If you ever, you know, remember uh, working through math books with, you know, most of the math books is just math problems. And all of Hegel's text is just one giant, endless, self-building math problem. And the only way to get to the math problem is not to talk about the math problem, but to work it through. So we got to work it out. Uh, so uh, hopefully you find this exercise as useful as I did. Uh, I know that I'm not the typical reader uh, because I was. Uh, it took me like about an entire week to work through the first chapter, which was uh, being to becoming. And most of that was an entire week spent breaking my head on like how you get from like the, the very last five pages of chapter one to chapter two. Uh, and I spent an inordinate amount of time on it and... Uh, then it clicked one day. And uh, ever since then, uh, it's sort of just been a trajectory of refining the process. And uh, my emphasis is on the method. So I'm not going to give you a lot of historical commentary. I'm not going to give you a lot of relational commentary to this philosopher, or that philosopher, or, you know, for example, what other philosophers later after Hegel uh, would say about him or how they relate to him. Because frankly, one, I don't know very much about them. I know mostly generalities. I know a little bit about Heidegger, a little about Deleuze, a little bit about uh, all the people who come after, you know, who critique Hegel. Uh, but I'm not going to like pretend to you that I can properly relate, say, something like what Heidegger's uh, critique of Hegel is through Heidegger's philosophy and, uh, you know, whether Heidegger is right or not. Um, so let's not worry about that. And Hegel himself will tell us these things like, don't worry too much about relating things uh, because it's not going to be as important as you think it is. Uh, you're told that you need a lot of history for Hegel. The truth is, no, you don't. And uh, the proof of the pudding is in the eating. I've eaten that pudding. My friends have eaten that pudding with me. <laughs> Hyperion here is, uh, was part of the original reading group. Uh, we worked through that. And... Uh, if you wish to understand things in that kind of sense um, and see like where that can get you, uh, I can 
point you to or towards uh, my various other videos where I've done these readings before, as well as um, the blog that I've written and the articles that I keep putting out. And uh, you will notice that my emphasis is almost entirely on the method, more so than anything. Um, another thing to add is why of all things is this book uh, truly the most important uh, of Hegel's all works entirely? Uh, actually, in these prefaces, if you read them or if, well, we'll be reading them here anyways, uh, Hegel actually mentions that uh, there's something weird about logic. Uh, and logic here ends up clearly being logic in no ordinary sense. Logic ends up being initially about what we would normally call metaphysics. And uh, that is a definitely interesting issue um, because I think that a lot of people who come to Hegel, particularly if you are acquainted with Marx and you're interested in Marxist project, for example, uh, what they want to know is uh, they want to get dialectics. Uh, and they think that this is useful for something, that you can do something with this. Uh, obviously, you can do something with this. Obviously, Hegel did something with this. He made a philosophy book. Uh, Obviously, other people think they can do something with it, and mostly it's making philosophy books. Uh, if you think that uh, somehow you can do something else with it, um, it is kind of weird. <laughs> um, excuse me, I think my headphones turned off. Uh, post uh, your questions to that channel. Uh, sorry. Uh, for some reason, my headset turns off randomly. Uh, it's fully charged. Actually, it's still charging, so uh, it shouldn't happen, but it uh, kind of automatically turns off because it uh, doesn't detect uh, that I'm playing any sound, and supposedly it's conserved battery, but it's annoying. Um, anyways, where was I? Uh, so people think this is useful for something. From my personal experiences, that yes, is actually useful for far more than just philosophy, but it's not going to be useful in uh, a way in which, for example, the law of gravity is going to be useful in letting you do something physical. Uh, rather, what this is useful for is it's going to give you a completely different sense of what thought is. It's going to completely reframe and reform the way you think. Uh, once you work through something like this, whether you buy as to its conclusions or not, uh, nonetheless, the fact that you've done it and you've worked it through is basically a monumental brain rewiring ex exercise. <laughs> so uh, you will find this um, just something that once you get the hang of it, it's just going to pop up in your everyday life of just about anything. Uh, not as something about your life and the things you do in it, but simply as a way in which you will see that these things appear in your life and you had never been aware of them. Uh, Hegel will mention here in the prefaces, particularly the second preface, that it's very weird that we have this notion that we use logic or that we use thought in a way that it is a sort of kind of tool for us. Uh, and he actually makes this interesting analogy about how we don't, relate to our feelings uh, and emotions and drives uh, in that way. You know, it's kind of, it would be weird for us to say we use our emotions for something. Uh, although there are clearly people who want to say things like that, mostly these weird materialist analytics uh, <laughs> who for some reason think of the world in these functional terms, uh, including themselves. Uh, but beyond that, uh, you know, when we actually examine these things, we're going to find that... Uh, that's not really how we relate to thought. Really, thought is the very way in which the relations of the world come together for us, how the world appears as a world to us, um, and how we act in the world in that way. So uh, you're going to get a completely different sense of all of that. And I think that's probably the greatest, if you would call that, use of this work and this kind of philosophy. Uh, personally, it's uh, caused 
definitely deep changes, not just in the way I think about things, but in the way I uh, actually emotionally relate to the world, in the way I empathize and sympathize with the world. Um, and I can't tell you how that happens. I just know that it has happened. And I know that it's related to the way in which this thought uh, operates. So it's an interesting thing. Uh, you know, it's in many ways, uh, there's people who describe this as sort of like, you know, once it clicks, it's this kind of religious moment, religious conversion a, in which, you know, like you're, you're, you're unable to unsee it and it blinds you because it seems so dazzling. It seems so amazing, uh, unlike anything. Uh, and eventually you kind of uh, start seeing through the blinding light, you get used to it, and um, you kind of stop, you know, going, oh, dialectics this, dialectics that, um, you know, it's just like how Marxists do this a lot, in which they, they, they're dazzled by the functionality and operationality and how, how intelligible it makes things seem. Uh, and it takes a while for you to come back down to the reality and, <laughs> you know, realize it's not as uh, big a deal as you make it initially, but it is a big deal. Uh, and the more you get a hang of it, the more you contextualize it, the uh, more of a big deal it becomes simply because it just becomes a part of your everyday life. Uh, and it does seem weird to say that something like, you know, it's like a logic of just like being or whatever is going to become a part of your everyday life. Uh, but it is. <laughs> so anyways, uh, that was just a little bit about me, a little bit about uh, what you might expect uh, to get out of this, uh, beyond what you might have already have expected to get up beyond it, uh, out of it. So uh, let's just get to it. Uh, so we're starting with the Objective Logic Book 1, The Doctrine of Being, the preface to the first edition. So here we go. The complete transformation that the ways of philosophical thought have undergone amongst us in the past 25 odd years, the higher standpoint in self-awareness that spirit has attained in this period of time has so far had little influence on the shape of the logic. What was hitherto called metaphysics has been, so to speak, extirpated root and branch and has vanished from the ranks of the sciences. Where are the voices still to be heard of the ontology of former times, of the rational psychology, the cosmology, or indeed even of the natural theology of the past? Or where are they allowed to be heard? Inquiries, for instance, into the immateriality of the soul, into mechanical and final causes, where is interest in them still to be found? Even the former proofs of God's existence are cited only out of historical interest or for the purpose of edification and the uplifting of the mind. The fact is that interest, whether in the content or in the form of the former metaphysics, or in both together, has been lost. Remarkable as it is, if a people has become indifferent, for instance, to its constitutional law, to its convictions, its moral customs and virtues, just as remarkable it is when a people loses its metaphysics, when the spirit engaged with its pure essence no longer has any real presence in its life. Give me a second. Uh... The exoteric teaching of the Kantian philosophy that the understanding ought not to be allowed to soar above experience lest the cognitive faculty become a theoretical reason that by itself would beget nothing but mental fancies. This was the justification coming from the scientific camp for renouncing speculative thought. In support of this popular doctrine, there was added the cry of alarm of modern pedagogy that the pressing situation of the time called for attention to immediate needs, that just as in the ways of knowledge experience is first, so for skill in public and private life, exercise and practical education are the essential. They alone what is required, while theoretical insight is even harmful. With science and common sense, thus working hand in hand to cause the downfall of metaphysics, the singular spectacle came into view of a cultivated people without metaphysics, like a temple richly ornamented in other respects, but without a holy of holies. Theology, which in former times was the custodian of the speculative mysteries and of the albeit subordinate metaphysics, had relinquished this last science in exchange for feelings, popular practicality, and erudite historiography. And it was in keeping with this change that, for their part, those solitary individuals 
whom their people had exiled from the world and dedicated to the contem contemplation of the eternal, also disappeared. Theirs was a life devoted exclusively to the service of contemplation without practical gain, but only for the sake of blessedness, and their disappearance can be regarded as essential, as essentially the same phenomenon, though in a different context, as the one just mentioned. And so this darkness, this colorless self-preoccupation of spirit bent upon itself, having been dispelled, existence shown transformed into a bright world of flowers, of which, as it is well known, none is black. Logic did not fare quite as badly as metaphysics. That from logic one learns how to think, which for lack of anything else was considered its usefulness and therefore its purpose, just as if one were to learn how to digest or to move first from the study of anatomy and physiology, this is a prejudice that has long been put to rest. And in this respect, the spirit of practicality certainly did not intend any better fate for logic than it did for its sister science. Nevertheless, probably for the sake of certain formal utility, a place was still allowed for this among the sciences. It was even retained as a subject of public instruction. However, this better lot concerns only the outer fate of logic, for its shape and content have remained the same throughout a long inherited tradition, though progressively more diluted and emaciated in the course of the transmission. No trace is so far to be detected in it of the new spirit that has awakened in the sciences, no less than the world of actuality. However, once the substantial form of the spirit has reconstituted itself, it is of no avail to want to retain the forms of an earlier culture. These are like withered leaves pushed aside by new buds already being generated at their roots. Nope. Give me a second on this. Uh, anyways, just comment on that. So he mentions that uh, that from logic one learns how to think, which for lack of anything else was considered its usefulness and therefore its purpose, just as if one were to learn how to digest or to move first from the study of anatomy and physiology. This is a prejudice that has long been put to rest in this respect the spirit of practicality. Certainly did not intend any, far, any better fate for logic than it did for its sister science. Uh, so this seems kind of a, a weird claim because that's the exact claim that has been made for the last uh, 200 years or so after Hegel, uh, which is, at least from the analytic camp, that logic is supposed to teach you how to think. Uh, and this is repeated ad nauseum, uh, endlessly. Uh, so if this was obviously already proven, you know, it's a prejudice that has long been put to rest, uh, why is it that we still have that around? You know, you still go to uh, online forums, for example, uh, on philosophy, and the people who are uh, accredited have uh, their papers, have their PhDs, and uh, teach philosophy will tell people, oh, yes, logic is to teach you how to think. You know, it's to teach you how to think properly. Um, but is that really the case? Uh, Kant actually has uh, an essay in which he talks about... Um, being unable to teach good judgment, that there's a difference between valid reasoning and good judgment. And what matters in the world is not really this functional, uh, formalistic valid reasoning, which is what formal logic can teach, which is, you know, like if A and B, and if B then C, if A, you know, A, therefore B, therefore C. Uh, Kant uh, says, well, you know, that's sort of a trivial, uh, useless kind of thing insofar as uh, that only makes it so that formally whatever gets input stays consistent with what uh, another one who uh, has a, a bit of a, a comment on this is uh, the Russian philosopher and uh, Marxist um, or rather Hegelian Marxist uh, Evald Ilyenkov uh, who has this essay called Our Schools Must Teach How to Think, in which uh, he brings up that uh, reference to Kant. And he, uh, he mentions how, you know, at least uh, empirically, if you look at uh, how uh, things have ended up in the wake of, uh, of uh, well, all of history, uh, Kant seems to be right, which is uh, that indeed uh, teaching people formal logic 
has nothing at all to do with making them good thinkers or having good reasons for anything. Uh, in the Soviet Union, for example, formal logic was required teaching for everybody, uh, I think around the, think around the seventh and eighth grade. Uh, by the time you got to college, you still had to get a refresher course on those things, and you, cou you couldn't get a, a PhD in anything without, you know, having proved your chops on it, on regurgitating the valid arguments according to the Soviet Academy. Uh, you know, despite how much they tried to get people to uh, see the irrationality of things like idealism or the irrationality of things like believing in God or religion, uh, if you came into the system believing in God, you got out of the system believing in God. Uh, if you became into the system believing in some weird stuff, paranormal stuff, you got out of the system believing in paranormal stuff. Um, you learn how to think about it more uh, formally, validly, but you still ended up seeing no problem in believing supposedly nonsensical things according to the very logic which you were taught. Uh, so Ilankov says, you know, at least empirically that seems to be the case. But he disagrees with Kant in which he says, uh, Kant is wrong to say that uh, we can't teach good judgment. Indeed, good judgment is not to be taught in a formal way, but there are ways in which the school system is supposed to be set up such that people are given the the room to exercise their reason in the way that it's actually naturally supposed to be exercised. Uh, and I'm not going to go very much further into that, uh, just to say that um, uh, he bases this judgment on the way that the logic works, in which uh, the logic works with actual reasoning about actual things, and it's not about formal empty reasoning about nothing. Uh, and once we get to it, uh, I hope that you see the light of that as well. I'll try to explain it uh, as best as I can as we go along once we hit the, the road on the, that matter. Continuing. Uh, also in the scientific realm, this ignoring of the universal change is gradually beginning to lose ground. The new ideas have imperceptibly become the accepted currency even to those opposed to them. Oh, did I skip something? Okay, no, no. Sorry about that. Let me restart. Uh, also in the scientific realm, this ignoring of the universal change is gradually beginning to lose ground. The new ideas have imperceptibly become the accepted currency, even to those opposed to them. And if these continue to fuss about their sources and principles and to dispute them, they have nevertheless surrendered to their consequences, unable to fend off their influence. They have no other way of giving a positive importance and some content to their increasingly irrelevant negative attitude except by, failing, by falling in with the new ways of thinking. However, the period of fermentation that goes with the beginning of every new creation seems to be past. In its first manifestation, a new creation usually behaves toward the, towards the entrenched systematization of the earlier principle with fanatical hostility. In fear of losing itself in the expansion of the particular, it also shuns the labor that goes with scientific cultivation and nevertheless in need of it. It grasps at first at an empty formalism. The demand for the elaboration and cultivation of the material becomes at that point all the more pressing. There is a period in the formation of an epoch in which, just as in the formation of the individual, the foremost concern is the acquisition and reinforcement of the principle in its undeveloped intensity. But the higher demand is that such a principle should be made into science. Now, whatever might already have happened to the substance and form of science in other respects, the science of logic that makes up metaphysics proper or pure speculative philosophy has to date, has to date been much neglected. What I more precisely understand by this science and its standpoint, I have provis provisorily stated in the introduction. The fact that it was necessary to make a completely fresh start with this science, the nature itself of its subject, matter, and the lack of any previous work that could have been used for the undertaken reform of it may be taken into account by the fair-minded critic if even a labor of many years was unable to give this effort a greater perfection. The essential point to be kept in mind is that an altogether new concept of scientific procedure is at work here. As I have remarked elsewhere, inasmuch as philosophy is to be science, it cannot borrow its method from a subordinate science such as mathematics any more than it can remain satisfied with categorical assurances of inner intuition or can make use of argumentation based on external reflection. On the contrary, 
It can only be the nature of the content which is responsible for the movement in scientific knowledge, for it is the content's own reflection that first posits and generates what that content is. The understanding determines and holds the, determin the determination fixed. Reason is negative and dialectical, since it dissolves the determinations of the understanding into nothing. It is positive, since it generates the universal and comprehends the particular therein. So uh, here we have some of the descriptions of the method. And um, if uh, you know, you're not acquainted with the method, don't get too caught up with these descriptions. Uh, they're not going to make full sense yet. Uh, they're just descriptions. Uh, they're little uh, tidbits of what's to come much, much later. Uh, and uh, let me read a comment here. Uh, one of the members states, formal logic deals with the formal conditions of knowledge. It leaves content out of it. Through it, you can only establish the coherence of a set of judgments. Think of it like this. You can establish that a story someone told you is not contradictory, but you cannot establish through logic alone its content is true. Uh, that's a very good example of uh, that difference between uh, just form and content uh, in formal logic. Uh, thank you, City Slevin. So continuing, uh, just as the understanding is usually taken as something separate from reason in general, so also dialectical reason is taken as something separate from positive reason. In its truth, reason is, however, spirit, which is higher than both reason bound to the understanding and understanding bound to reason. It is the negative, that which constitutes the quality of both the dialectical reason and the understanding. It negates the simple, thereby posits the determinate difference of the understanding, but it equally dissolves this difference, and so it is dialectical. But spirit does not stay at the nothing of this result, but is, in it, but is in it rather equally positive and thereby restores the first simplicity, but as universal, such it is, as it is concrete in itself. A given particular is not subsumed under this universal, but on the contrary, it has already been determined together with the determining of the difference and the dissolution of this determining. This spiritual movement, which in its simplicity gives itself its determinateness, and in this determinateness gives itself its self-equality, this movement, which is thus the imminent development of the concept, is the absolute method of the concept, the absolute method of cognition, and at the same time the imminent soul of the content. On this self-constructing path alone, I say, is philosophy capable of being objective, demonstrative science. In this fashion have I tried to portray consciousness in the phenomenology of spirit. Consciousness is spirit as concrete, self-aware knowledge. To be sure, a knowledge bound to externality, but the progression of this subject matter, like the development of all natural and spiritual life, rests exclusively on the nature of the pure essentialities that constitute the content of the logic. Consciousness, as spirit which on the way of manifesting itself, frees itself from its immediacy and external concre concretion, attains to the pure knowledge that takes these same pure essentialities for its subject matter as they are in and for themselves. They are pure thoughts, spirit that thinks its essence. Their self-movement is their spiritual life and is that through which science constitutes itself and of which it is the exposition. So uh, that was a big paragraph with a lot of stuff that uh, when you initially encounter it uh, is way over your head. Uh, mostly because it's intended to be way over your head. Uh, uh, in many ways, and Hegel actually talks about this in the uh, prefaces of the phenomenology, for example, uh, prefaces aren't ever really fully and properly prefaces uh, which prepare you for the work so much as uh, also offer a, the authors, or philosophers in this case, both um, own attempt to give you a sneak peek of the big thing to come. So a lot of these things like uh, understanding, reason, dialectical, positive, positing, universal, spirit, uh, don't yet quite make full sense, won't make full sense until you've actually undergone the development of these concepts themselves. Uh, but uh, once you get to that point and you go back to these uh, little pieces in the preface, uh, you will find them to be incredibly spot-on descriptions.
And uh, I'm not going to go too much more into those. Uh, the main reason is because uh, it's like uh, what he says earlier about uh, attempting to uh, learn to digest by uh, looking at anatomy. Uh, you digest first, and because of the whole living organism and its actualities, later then you have the objects to which you can then look upon and start uh, understanding and differentiating and putting together the parts of how digestion works. So um, to attempt to describe to you in another more detailed uh, advance of what he's describing here is sort of pointless because we'll get to that anyways when we begin the work of the logic um, and there is where you'll get the real taste of what it really is as opposed to just shadows which uh, depending on how many layers of that shadow there are still remain merely shadows. Continuing, the connection of the science that I call phenomenology of spirit to the logic is thereby stated. As regards the way it stands to its external, to it externally, a second part was intended to follow the first part of the system of science that contains the phenomenology. The second part would have contained the logic both, and both the two real sciences of philosophy, the philosophy of nature and the philosophy of spirit, and would have brought the system of science to completion. However, the necessary expansion which the logic demanded by itself has led me to have this particular part published separately. It therefore constitutes the first sequel to the phenomenology of spirit and an expanded plan of the system of science. I shall later follow up with the treatment of both the two mentioned real sciences of philosophy. This first volume of the logic contains the doctrine of being as book one. Book two, the second section of the same volume, which contains the doctrine of essence, is already in the presses. Finally, the second volume will contain the subject of logic or the doctrine of the concept. All right. Uh, so just a little comment on uh, his mentioning of the phenomenology spirit. Uh, there is contention amongst scholars as well as uh, obviously lay people who are getting into this about a certain confusion of what is supposed to be studied first uh, and what is actually necessary. Uh, there are a lot of people who will tell you, you you're supposed to read the phenomenology of spirit first. There's people who will tell you much less now that uh, you can do without it, uh, that there's a, a way in which like it's a presupposition, but at the same time it's not. Uh, I'm part of the people who tell you that uh, you don't need to read the phenomenology spirit to make sense of the logic, and that the logic is not justified in any way by the phenomenology spirit. Uh, the phenomenology of spirit is, properly speaking, its own little negative system, which is only to be done and undergone if you're so stubborn that you cannot get with a program in the beginning of the science of logic with what Hegel demands and asks us to do, which is to just uh, blank our minds uh, about all the things that we think we know about anything, about all the things which seem obvious to us, and to just forget about it. Just think about what we're going to think about. Um, for those who can't get with that program and who think that, for example, you need, you cannot do this, you, sh you shouldn't be doing metaphysics or logic first, you should be doing epistemology first, uh, you sh do have to read the phenomenology spirit because that's Hegel's big argument against that whole line of thinking, which is the big line of thinking that dominates modern philosophy from uh, Descartes all the way to Kant. So if you're somebody who, for whom knowledge and knowing and consciousness are inescapable things that must be dealt with first and above all, you should read the phenomenology. Although, unfortunately, because of the way the, phenomenolo the phenomenology is written, you really won't quite understand why Hegel gets to conclude what he does conclude. Uh, a lot of people read through that uh, and don't really understand how the method works and what really solidly links the entire arguments. Uh, but they get a gist of kind of what's the problem, but not exactly why the conclusion ends up being what it ends up being. Uh, I think in my own experience that if you read the logic first, even if you don't complete the logic, even if you get just the hang of the first chapter, if you get that experience and return back to the phenomenology spirit, not only will you have 
uh, a much easier time because uh, the logic demands immediately a lot more of you. But once you get a hang of that, you're going to find that that clarifies a lot of things in the phenomenology when you go back. Uh, and because you get a hang of the method and, and uh, hopefully you get a practice with that, you'll see the method working itself out to the phenomenology of spirit. And these transitions from one thing to another will be a lot more intelligible to you. They will make a lot more sense. And you might actually see what is the solid link about the entirety of all the arguments, or rather the one big argument that constitutes the phenomenology of spirit. Uh, that is something really valuable. Uh, and it gives you a completely different perspective of the phenomenology than uh, basically anyone else that I've ever encountered, to be honest. Uh, not even the Hegel scholars who uh, I very much respect and whose readings I can uh, mostly go with and uh, I think are uh, pretty on point uh, for the most part. Uh, not even they can go into the level of detail of what I have found that you can find for yourself if you understand how the system works and how the method moves. Um, and you'll find interpretations which uh, other people won't catch. And you will find ways of um, explaining to yourself the way things move in ways that uh, other people haven't. Uh, and that's a big, big value of this, that when you go through this exercise, you're going to get uh, not the tools, but you're actually going to get the capacities. You're going to develop the skill of actually closely reading and closely thinking through uh, concepts. And uh, this will make not only the rest of Hegel easier, but it will make everybody else infinitely easier. Uh, uh, you know, people joke about this, um, and it's not so much of a joke. Uh, a lot of people from all walks say that when you try to, ta to, to tackle Hegel, and you, know, you really try, uh, going back to anybody else seems infinitely easier. And it's true. Uh, as a matter of fact, most other philosophy, frankly, seems boring to me because it is so easy compared to Hegel. <laughs> But all right, uh, there's some comments. Let me uh, read through them. Uh, Spirit uh, commented, the preface is not part of the science and is not scientifically determined determined in the preface. He says you just do the science to know how he's using the words so precisely in what feels like perfect definitions of ordinary, of ordinary words. The preface, although accurate, is not the science itself. Maybe this is what he's saying. Uh, yeah, that's what I was uh, saying, and I think that's what he was saying as well. Uh, see these comments. An important idea of this paragraph is the idea that differentiation emerges through negation. That's uh, commenting on the paragraph, uh, sort of describing the, uh, the method. Uh, the parts, which implies a lack of difference, but again, this difference itself is negated, and that which has was different becomes an instance of a more encompassing totality. Think of an organism which begins with only a simple, undifferentiated cell, and through negations of its actual determinations, differentiates itself into an array of codependent organs, which has their end and means within the organic whole. Uh, yes, they would say that's a proper description as well. Um, and even then... Uh, like uh, Spirit mentioned that uh, there's, there is what feels like perfect definitions of ordinary words. Uh, there's something mentioned in the second preface, which uh, I'll go over on specifically about that because I think that's actually key. Uh, Hegel-y sounds alien to you now. Uh, when you get a hang of it, it will sound like everyday speech. Uh, and it will just not be like it. But I think that once you get a hang of it, it's very hard not to see how everyday language has always been mapping what Hegel ends up uh, clarifying in very strict, rigid uh, uh, conceptual terms. Uh, and that is like one of, the, one of the most interesting things about this. This philosophy is not alien to your everyday life. It is, once you understand the terms, so close to everyday life that uh, 
it just becomes a common language for you. Uh, not just that you're walking around talking in jargon like sublation and dialectics or anything, but rather like, you know, when you speak about determinacies and something being determinate or determining or being determined, uh, you're not you're going to be unable to help yourself in like calling into mind the way Hegel has clarified these things for us. Uh, it's really interesting. Uh Uh, CD11 for uh, for the comments. I would say that the phenomenology of spirit is useful for those who insist that consciousness, the subject-object relationship, is the final framework for philosophy. Um, definitely, I agree with that. Uh, I think the text bears that out in the phenomenology of spirit as well. Uh, spirit comments. We know definitely that the phenomenology of spirit is not the beginning of this section where he talks of consciousness comes way after the logic in the last book of the system, which is philosophy of spirit, and why he's clarifying to us that the logic comes first. In his lectures on the philosophy of spirit, he makes this explicitly clear that we can eliminate the confuse, the confused, uh, the confusion definitely from our age. He started with phenomenology of spirit because the terms are familiar enough that people uh, were uh, who were not. Uh, let me see. Sorry, there's something weird. Uh, Uh, who would not get completely aboard with the, the abstractions of pure logic, which seems too familiar to be engaging. Uh, that seems to make sense. Uh, Ronnie Dazzler, is the first differentiation through negation being? I'm just trying to think beyond the postmodern framework of difference in the always already. Uh, I'll skip that question because uh, we'll get to that mm, later. Not much later, actually. You'd be surprised at how soon that gets to in the text. Uh, CC11. For the comments, understanding, simply put, is simply the faculty of establishing the determinations of a certain object. It fixes an object's properties, just like when a mathematician defines a set, establishing the rule of inclusion of any element. When you say, the banana is blue, you are making a judgment, basically establishing a certain property of a certain subject. Every time you fix something's properties, you are using your understanding. Problem is, things are not fixed, they change, and as they change, the properties change. Think it like this, understanding is a photograph, is a photograph, Reason is a movie. Uh, that analogy works to a certain extent, but um, I don't think it fully works. Uh, mainly, mainly the thing to understand about that is understanding is the faculty which distinguishes things and uh, uh, allows us to say this is this, this as opposed to that. Uh, and, you know, uh, a cookie is a cookie. Uh, a banana is a banana car is a car, and these things are differentiated uh, in a way in which uh, implicitly, yes, they're being differentiated through negative relations to other things, but the way the understanding makes them appear is that they seem to be defined as if out of nowhere uh, on their own for themselves. Uh, reason ends up being something that uh, not only is moving but it is a totality in which uh, movement makes sense. Uh, you could think about reason as space itself uh, in the natural world. Uh, everything, all pieces of matter are differentiated or negated through space. They are uh, individualized. We have this piece of matter as opposed to that piece of matter because they're divided by space in between. Space is both their negation, the thing that separates them and identifies them, as not each other, uh, it also happens to be the very ground in which they can actually even be opposed and related negatively as well as positively. Um, so Hegel ends up making a very specific term for this called negative unity. Uh, and that is also what ends up being the case for what we call the concept. Uh, don't get too caught up on that. Uh, that will make a lot more sense once we get to that. So, all right, uh, let's move on to the second preface, which uh, is even more in-depth and uh, goes into some more interesting things. Uh, preface to the second edition. 
I undertook this revision of the science of logic, of which the first volume is hereby being published, in full consciousness that not only the difficulty of its subject matter and of its exposition besides, but equally of the imperfection from which its treatment in the first edition suffers. As earnestly as I have striven after many years of further occupation with this science to remedy this imperfection, I still feel that I have cause en enough to appeal to the reader's indulgence. One title to such appeal in the first instance may well be based on the circumstance that for the most part only external material was available for its content in the earlier metaphysics and logic. Although the practice of these disciplines had been universal and customary, in the case of logic down to our time, its interest in, the, in their speculative side has been just as universally and customarily restricted. It is the same material which is repeated over and over again, whether it is thinned out to the point of trivial superficiality or whether the ancient ballast is freshly charted out and dragged to new lengths, so that, through these habitually only mechanical efforts, no gain could be had for the philosophical content. To display the realm of thought philosophically, that is, in its own imminent activity, or what is the same in its necessary development, had to be, therefore, a new undertaking, one that had to be started right from the beginning. Nevertheless, the received material, the known thought forms, must be regarded as an extremely important fund, even a necessary condition, a presupposition to be gratefully acknowledged, even though what it offers here and there is only a bare thread. The so uh, what is he talking about here? He's talking about the categories of philosophy, particularly the categories we know of as metaphysics in the history of all philosophy, you know, mostly, yes, it ends up being in, uh, virtually entirely the categories developed in and through Western philosophy. Uh, Hegel was aware of Eastern philosophy, particularly mostly Indian philosophy, but uh, even in his own day, there wasn't that much, but there was still enough to know that there was such a thing as an Indian tradition of philosophy and uh, even a Chinese tradition of philosophy. Uh, but Hegel ends up uh, dismissing them as a, uh, one of two things, either not properly philosophical because of their, uh, what, it's kind of funny, uh, you know, you kind of, we could kind of bring in a sort of Heideggerian uh, term into this, uh, ontotheology. They were too ontotheological, uh, mostly too theological for Hegel's taste. And he considered them, you know, despite being uh, truly properly abstract, they nonetheless were uh, still not completely metaphysical because they did not take these categories or these uh, concepts to be fully and essentially thought forms as such. So, you know, even though uh, in Indian philosophy you have something like Brahman, which uh, can be a stand-in for being, uh, the fact that it was not conceived as a thought as such, but still has connotations about consciousness, connotations about religious intuitions and all these other things, uh, no matter how abstract and universal and immaterial these concepts got, they were not yet concepts proper, uh, which turn out to be essentially concepts about concepts, uh, concepts which are really thoughts about thought itself. So that is um, part of uh, why Hegel, we won't find any Eastern categories in all of this, despite the fact that they do exist. Uh, second is that uh, Eastern categories, for the most part, insofar as they do exist, uh, if they are properly categories, also end up being redundant, uh, in as far as uh, we already have our own Western categories that do the job, so, you know, we are not going to use the Indian names or Chinese names for anything, because uh, we already have a name for it, we already have a tradition of it. Uh, these categories were developed haphazardly, uh, people having various kinds of intuitions, various kinds of insights here and there, uh, working through them in as much as they could, but uh, they never had this sort of genetic, uh, systematic self-development from a running thread through all of them that could be tied nice and neatly, neatly and brought together under the same rubric of, in which a method and a content are not different. And so we have that giant storehouse of categories, of which there are many, by the way. Um, uh, historically, the main categories that we will find in this work are the categories which were collected by uh, Christian Wolff, 
the German philosopher, uh, which uh, was probably the greatest advocate and systematizer of uh, the Leibnizian standpoint of things. Uh, and uh, quite a collection of categories once we uh, go through this work. Uh, but uh, even so, those were only coll collected, but uh, like anatomy, uh, simply having uh, a taxonomy of the parts of the body doesn't tell you really how the body works. It doesn't give you an actual understanding of life. And, uh, excuse me for that. And the same thing could be said about uh, logic. And uh, Hegel notes that logic uh, basically virtually did not change uh, since it was uh, invented by Aristotle all the way until the days of Kant. Uh, and that is something uh, interesting. And then at the same time, it's something quite expected. Uh, I think Kant himself uh, mentions that it's sort of a, uh, an interesting little quaint thing that uh, logic essentially remained unchanged uh, since the days of Aristotle. Uh, and that this was sort of to be expected because uh, of the very nature of uh, logic, uh, its fundamental aspect uh, made it to be both amenable to being one of the earliest discoveries. For one, there diff there's different kinds of logic that uh, arose. Uh, Aristotle's logic was what is now called a term logic. There was uh, later with the Stoics an arising of something called propositional logic, which uh, allowed certain things to happen which term logic does not allow. Uh, and there was uh, sort of this uh, movement back and forth between schools uh, of all kinds, uh, whether what kind of logic and how they thought certain things worked out in those logics. Uh, did go uh, but the broad the broad strokes of logic did begin <clears throat> did remain the same Right, reading some comments. Spirits mentions, uh, you're right that there was development on the logic, but it wasn't genuinely philosophical. It was further abstract development of the already dead bones of logic. Uh, yes, uh, that's, that's simply uh, obviously true. Uh, CDC 11 says, Hegel mentions that one of the most important contributions of modern empiricists to philosophy is the demand that the origin of the categories were established. Before, they were considered primary given concepts with no need of further clarification. This idea of exposing the origin and the relationship between the basic concepts of thought is a theme that goes through the entire modern philosophical tradition, from Bacon, Hume, to Fichte, and finally Hegel. You can find a very enlightening, enlightening treatment of this in the history of philosophy. No, oh, Hegel's history of philosophy. Uh, yes. And... Uh, Okay, here's something very interesting, uh, the next part on this. Continuing. The forms of thought are first set out and stored in human language, and one can hardly be reminded often enough nowadays that thought is what differentiates the human being from the beast. In everything that the human being has interiorized, in everything that in some way or other has become for him a representation, in whatever way he has made his own, there has language penetrated, and everything that he transforms into language and expresses in it contains a category, whether concealed, mixed, or well-defined. So much is logic natural to the human being, is indeed his very nature. If we have a contrast nature as such as the realm of the physical, with the realm of the spiritual, then we must say that logic is the supernatural element that permeates all his natural behavior, his ways of sensing, intuiting, desiring, his needs and impulses, and it thereby makes them into something truly human, even though only formally human, makes them into representations and purposes. It is to the advantage of a language when it possesses a wealth of logical expressions that is distinctive expressions specifically set aside for thought determinations. Many of the prepositions and articles are already certain, per 
already pertain to relations based on thought. In this, the Chinese language has apparently not advanced that far culturally, or at least not far enough. But such particles play a totally subordinate role, only slightly more independent than that of prefixes and suffixes, inflections, and the like. A uh, little bit on that Chinese thing. Now, uh, can't say whether Hegel is right or wrong in that. Most likely he's wrong. <laughs> uh, but it's a funny little thing. Uh, Leibniz praised the Chinese writing system and language for being, uh, as being superior to the Western alphabetic phonetic writing system of language. Uh, Leibniz thought that it was a far superior thing to communicate with ideograms in which we didn't have to spell out words, but rather what we represented was direct ideas, uh, mainly because this made it a lot easier uh, for you to make clear what it is that you're actually talking about and how those things actually relate. Uh, and Leibniz had this very uh, audacious idea for a universal language, which would now be called, uh, you know, just symbolic logic uh, of ideograms, not, not of P's and Q's and uh, logical operators, but uh, a mix of logical operators and ideograms of fundamental operative concepts, which in being put forth, uh, actually operate as logical operators themselves. So, um, you know, to put forth the concept of cause, for example, in a, in a logical sense of that kind, you would also put forth the concept of effect. Uh, you would have this relationship between them, and then you would have to bring things into that structure. Um, and uh, learning a little bit about Chinese language, uh, actually this week, as, uh, as Hegel puts it, uh, indeed what seemed to lack, be lacking, uh, if it ever was lacked uh, during his time, from what he knew, uh, was simply that the Chinese uh, forms of philosophy were one, uh, not known generally to Western thinkers. Uh, you know, very few things have been translated by, in the days of, of Hegel. Uh, mostly the stuff being translated was the very classical stuff, classical uh, Taoist uh, and uh, Confucian text. Uh, but the more advanced, developed philosophies of those uh, see, uh, SS mentions, there is a paradox in Chinese philosophy, white horse dialogue, which makes sense in ancient Chinese. It's a little tricky in English, though. The paradox can be resolved by rec recognizing that the lack of articles in the Chinese language contributes to semantic ambiguity. Uh, yes, actually, I have a book I've been reading on Chinese philosophy that mentions that, uh, that due to the way that the language was uh, structured before, there were a lot of like funny little things that you could do, logically speaking and semantically speaking. Uh, but these were later worked out uh, by, by later additions to the system of writing, as well as just conceptual analysis. Uh, Spirit mentions what Hegel didn't like was that the grammar of language is like the life of it, and making the universals or using Chinese language dependent on remote, on rote memorization rather than the fluidity of reason. The forms are there, but they are dead and lack necessity. Uh, CDC 11, apart from the polemics on the Suitability of different languages for philosophy. This paragraph is important because here he refers to a very important idea. All our thoughts are permeated by these categories. Take the category of something, for instance, as it is a very abstract category, a misconception of it will literally affect all your thinking. Uh, and yes, you know, to go back to uh, what was mentioned in the near the end of the prior preface, uh, the way in which all of this is uh, infused in the way we normally think uh, in uh, everyday life. Uh, it's full of these categories of things that have no referent whatsoever in the world. Uh, something is not an object in the world. Something is a category to grasp something in the world uh, cognitively, but it is not something that refers to something. Well, I mean, it's, see, it's hard, to, it's hard to speak about it even without referring to it through its own category. <laughs> It's not a thing. It's not a thing out there empirically in the world. It's a pure thought. So uh, you know, you need a language in which these pure thoughts, these categories, are developed. All right.
right, continuing. Um, do, do, do. Uh, much more important it is it, uh, much more important is that in a language the category should be expressed as substantives and verbs and thus be stamped into objective form. In this respect, the German language has many advantages over other modern languages, for many of its words also have the further peculiarity of carrying not just different meanings but opposite ones, and in this one cannot fail to recognize the language's speculative spirit. It can delight thought to come across such words and to discover a naive form already in the lexicon as one word of opposite meanings, that union of opposites which is the result of speculation but to the understanding is nonsensical. Philosophy, therefore, stands in no need of special terminology. True, some words are to be taken from foreign languages, yet through use these have already acquired citizenship in it, and an affected purism would be all the more out of place where everything depends on meaning the most. This is one of the things that I love about Hegel more. Uh, one of the, like it's it's up there. It's it's uh, to me one of the most valuable things about it. The fact that when you get it, Hegelianism is everyday language brought up to a really high philosophical like deepening. Like it does not replace everyday language. It doesn't shift you out of a mode of thinking in a, of the world in a way that is alien to it. Uh, you can literally talk to a random Yahoo who speaks the same language as you, and uh, you can make deep philosophical conversation uh, in a way that is actually intelligible to them. You know, it's not going to be fully intelligible, but mostly intelligible. Uh, it's actually kind of amazing. Uh, I've tried this. Uh, it's true. Uh, I've talked to other people who are Hegel scholars uh, who also see this. And uh, they find it that it is indeed true. Uh, unlike something like Heideggerianism, in which the kinds of words that are uh, in which like then to have a conversation with like a random person uh, is a, a battle of either disabusing them of like, no, 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 I don't mean things in the usual way. You know, you say car and you mean that machine over there, that, you know, that locomotive machine. But when I say car, I'm talking about some, you know, new metaphysical concept or, or something uh they, it causes community miscommunications it causes one to be forced to relearn things or rather not relearn things but to learn things anew and to have this sort of divide between this is the everyday understanding and this is you know this new understanding uh and hegel doesn't really work that way it's it's really wonderful like when you actually get the sense of it Um, I have quite a few articles in which uh, I've been trying to get that notion across that uh, uh, this is not far from what you mean in your everyday life in English. You know, if you talk about something, if you talk about existence, if you talk about being, if you talk about nothing, the way we mean things, the way we use things, and the way Hegel ends up clarifying them uh, are not very, very far. Uh, literally, it's... It's sort of having just a small shift of perspective. Uh, that's literally all it takes. And uh, interestingly, that's sort of the function of reason. Reason is just a fine line that you cross from understanding to reason, which is just a, a little change in perspective. Uh, one step leaves you in aporia, a paradox, uh, unintelligibility, the world falls apart because you have a dialectical contradiction and the understanding cannot grasp that. Uh, whereas reason just goes one little bit step further, just a tiny little move, and all of a sudden the world makes sense again. Uh, that thing which was complete nonsense makes complete sense, perfectly intelligible. All right. Let's continue. The advance of culture in general, and of the sciences in particular, even the empirical sciences, which are bound to the senses and generally operate in the medium of the most common categories, for example, whole and parts, a thing and its properties, and the like, gradually fosters the rise of thought relations that are also more advanced, or, 
It at least raises them to wider universality and consequently brings them to greater notice. In physics, for instance, where the predominant category previously was that of force, it is the category of polarity that now plays the most significant role, a category which incidentally is randomly being imposed all too often on everything, even on light. It defines a difference in which the different terms are inseparably bound together, and it is indeed of infinite identity by which a determinant is such as, for example, that a force acquires independent status in the determining form of difference, the difference that at the same time remains an inseparable moment of identity, is instead brought to the forefront and is given general acceptance. Just a little commentary on that. Uh, what he's talking about there is that uh, in Hegel's day, uh, the big kahuna of physics became electricity and electrodynamics. Uh, the, the main development there for, for a while was... Uh, the development of the laws of electricity, and um, and uh, there was a hell of a lot of things going on with electricity. Uh, part of that fascination, obviously, has to do with the fact that electricity is far more useful than gravity. You know, people were, were playing around with the equations of gravity quite a bit. Not much was accomplished beyond Newton. Uh, we still didn't have, you know, rockets and whatnot. There was very little to, to do with that. But when electricity became a thing that we could harness practically, uh, its understanding became paramount. And so a lot of interesting things uh, came about because of that. Uh, unfortunately, once we hit a certain kind of limit with electricity at the turn of the 19th century, uh, we went away, we went backwards, so to say, back away from the idea of polarity and uh, a dialectical conception of physics, uh, back to the Newtonian kind of worldview, not not. Newton's categories, but uh, going back to the standpoint of understanding or dividing things into singular and separated uh, entities, uh, to the point where nowadays we're in a a sort of like hyper form of all of this, in which uh, you know we have the fundamental theory of the theory of fundamental particles, uh, in which I think we have like an increasingly growing set of fundamental particles. Uh, beyond just material particles, you know, we, gravity is a particle, electricity is a particle, light is a particle, forces are particles. Um, it's a very bizarre little world uh, that, uh, when you actually look into it, does not make a lot of sense. Uh, it literally is just a broken taxonomy of things that no one understands how they come together, how they could come together, or, or why would they be expressed in the way that they are at all. Uh, and uh, there's been attempts, obviously, always to unify things, to simplify things, to bring things back into the notion of force, you know, to get the expression of the multiplicity back into the unity of the one, uh, as we will, this actually comes up, this is kind of uh, interesting, in the phenomenon of your spirit, force comes up in the third chapter, and a force comes up here in the second book, in the book of essence, the doctrine of essence. Uh, as a metaphysical concept, you know, you would think, oh, force, that's a, that's a sort of concept of, uh, you know, physics. Uh, and Hegel says, no, actually, force is a metaphysical concept. Uh, it's an interesting thing. Continuing. The study of nature because of the stable reality of its objects is inevitably led to fix categories that can no longer be ignored in it, even if with complete disregard for consistency towards other categories which are also allowed to stand, it is not given room for abstracting from opposition and moving on to generalities, as so easily happens when spirit is the object. So to, to bring it back to something I mentioned earlier uh, at the beginning, uh, giving you a simple overview of like what I think the usefulness of all this is and what people think the usefulness of it, of it is, uh, a lot of people see um, dialectics uh, and this knowledge of philosophy uh, as being useless because they're like, how can it be true? You know, how, how can you say there's a contradiction uh, about objects, for example? Like, what's the contradiction of an apple? Uh, it doesn't make any sense. Like, what do you mean there's a contradiction? The apple's an apple, the tree's a tree. You know, uh, sure, the apple has a skin, it has a meat, it has seeds, but where's the contradiction in that? 
Uh, where's the contradiction in gravity? Like, there's two bodies, you know, they gravitate towards each other. There's a force. Uh, every little piece is different. You know, matter is different from the force of gravity. The force of gravity is different from space. Uh, that's different from time. Uh, all the elements are distinguished. Uh, there is no chance of saying uh, that things, you know, become each other because the fact is that in empirical experience, that's not the case at all. You know, sure, you know, we see developments in organic entities, for example, and we see things erode and change in time, uh, but we don't see time become space. We don't see space become time. Uh, we don't see, you know, subject become object in real time or anything like that. Uh, so a lot of people are properly and rightfully skeptical about some really weird, seem well, seemingly weird claims that some people make uh, in trying to say that there is a use for this. You know, this is mostly, of course, uh, a thing that Marxists do, uh, more so than anybody else, uh, in which, you know, they're, they're desperate to try to make this seem practically useful. Uh, and it's not really the true, uh, the true case. Uh, it's useful, and the use is a very bizarre use, but it's not useful in this kind of practical ways. It's sort of useless to talk about apples and trees and ecologies as uh, under the category of contradiction. You know, we, we have better categories to talk about those things. Contradiction is a sort of useless thing for most of the things. Uh, but dialectics uh, as something apparent in your everyday reality uh, is not going to be something that uh, will be apparent in anything that you can empirically grasp. Uh, no thing in the world that you can actually touch and grab uh, will really express to you like how real the movement of uh, reality is. All right, continuing. But even when logical matters and their expressions are common coin in a culture, still, as I said, as I have said elsewhere, what is familiar is for that reason not known. It can even be a source of irritation to have to occupy oneself with the familiar. And what could be more familiar than just those determinations of thought which we employ everywhere and are on our lips in every sentence that we utter to indicate the general features of the course that cognition goes through as it leaves familiar acquaintance behind the essential moments in the relationship of scientific thought to this natural thought. This is the purpose of the present preface together with the earlier introduction it will suffice for a general idea of what is meant by logical cognition, the kind of general idea which is demanded of a science prior to the science itself. And uh, Ronnie Dazzler, not sure I get what is familiar, uh, the quote, what is familiar is for that reason, quote, uh, rather that reason, unknown, unquote, line. Uh, hey there, Dan, glad you could join us. Uh, uh, the meaning of that is uh, that Familiarity is that intuitive ease of use that we have of things. You know, we all we all know what something is, right? You know, nobody had to like philosophize and stand around, around to like know what something is. Uh, you know, somebody asks you, "Hey, pass me the something over there," and you're like, "Okay." You look over there; it's not specified. You know, one, it's an object. You know, it's a, it's an object out there. Yeah, so it has to be an object present. So you know, all these things just out of just like the acquaintance with everyday life. Uh, it's familiar, but when somebody asks you, what is something, you know, you immediately run back to that familiarity and you're like, well, what do you mean? What is something? Uh, this is something, you know, my hand is something. Uh, what, what more is there to it? And somebody says, no, no, I want you to tell me what the intelligibility of just something as such is. You're like, what are you talking about? Uh, another thing is rights. I mean, like here, rights is perfect, right, Dan? Everybody talks about rights. Ask somebody on the street, anybody, even a college-educated person, what the hell is a right? And you realize all of a sudden you have no idea what the hell it is. You know, we talk about rights all the time. We have no idea in the, our everyday life what that actually is. We have an intuitive acquaintance. We have a familiarity. But when we're asked what is a right as such, it becomes such a disturbingly troubling thing. Uh, 
this was actually my introduction to philosophy proper. I uh, like my first philosophy class I took, and it wasn't a philosophy class even in the curriculum. Uh, it was just considered critical thinking. And uh, one of the final essays uh, in I did in that class was about rights. And uh, it struck me. I had no idea what in the hell a right was. I had never thought about it. Everybody talks about it. We had been in class discussing rights and, you know, what kind of, what rights we have, you know, why we have rights and whatnot. And I had never thought, and nobody in the class had ever thought, what the hell is a right? Uh, and uh, I literally skipped class for like two weeks because I would just be at home reading these philosophical articles trying to understand what a right actually is because uh, it bothered the heck out of me. So um, Dan says, ah, so once familiar, we have stopped thinking through it and thus don't know it. So the colloquial covers truth. The colloquial obfuscates it or functions an illegitimate sense of certainty. Uh, yeah, that's basically it. You know, we become acquainted with a word. We can become acquainted with its reference in social usage. Uh, but we have never actually been acquainted with it as a pure concept itself. I mean, it's like thinking. Uh, thinking is another thing. We all think, you know, somebody, like, ask somebody, like, what is thought? I uh, said so that's probably the easiest one to, like, more, it's even easier than right. And nobody has an idea what the hell a thought is. Uh, you know, you ask uh, a high school, you ask somebody in college, you ask a professor that's not a philosophy professor, uh, what the hell is a thought? And they're like, you know, you realize you do it all the time. How is it possible that you don't actually know what it is? You know, because a, a thought is, okay, the first thing you think is it, it's something that happens in my head. But beyond that, what is it? You know, uh, is it a material thing? Uh, is it an immaterial thing? If it's immaterial, where is it? Is it here? Is it somewhere else? Uh, it's it's just a very bizarre situation, you know. It's those things we are we're familiar with. You know, we talk about all the time. You know, I th you know I thought of this thing yesterday. I'm thinking about this thing right now, and then suddenly somebody stops you and asks, "What is thought?" And you don't know. Uh, City 11 says, it is not only difficult to provide a definition, but also to provide a method that ascertains that the conceptual limits you impose into a certain concept are justified as they are. Uh, yes, that's definitely true. And uh, don't apologize for interrupting, Dan. That's the whole point of this thing. Uh, I want people to ask questions. Uh, you know, this is to help people who are not acquainted with any of this. You know, any questions anybody here has, Please ask them. All right, continuing. First of all, it must be regarded as an infinite step forward that the forms of thought have been freed from the material in which they are submerged in self-conscious intuition, in representation, as well as in our desires and volitions, or more accurately, in ideational desiring and willing. And there is no human desire or volition without ideation. A step forward that these universalities have been brought to light. Uh, wait, a step forward that these universalities have been brought to light and made the subject of study on their own, as was done by Plato and after him by Aristotle. Especially, this step marks the beginning of our knowledge of them. Quote, Only after almost everything which is necessary to life and pertains to its comfort and sociability was made available, says Aristotle, did man begin to trouble himself with philosophical knowledge. Unquote. Quote, in Egypt, unquote, he said previously, he had previously remarked, quote, there was an early development of the mathematical sciences because there were priestly castes. There the priestly castes were brought early to a state of leisure, end quote. Indeed, the need to occupy oneself with pure thoughts presupposes a long road that the human spirit 
must have traversed. It is the need, one may say, of having already attained the satisfaction of necessary need, the need of freedom from need, of abstraction from the material intuition, imagination, and so forth, from the material of the concrete interest of desire, impulse, will, in which the determinations of thought hide as if behind a veil. In the silent regions of thought that has come to itself and communes only with itself, the interests that move the life of peoples and individuals are hushed. So just a little quip there. Uh, I can't remember which one it, it is specifically, whether it's like Marx or Engels that says this, but they both had the same idea. Uh, in which they said, you know, like philosophers forget that, you know, uh, before people can think and, you know, philosophize, you know, they need to eat and live. Uh, and of course, you know, this is kind of a, a weird thing that they thought they had to say this because uh, here is the, the, one of the foundational philosophers of the West uh, saying it since the very beginning. <laughs> you know, like never forgotten that, you know, in order to philosophize and ideate, you have to eat and think. Oh, no eat and work yeah. just kind of a weird thing uh, CDC 11 says this idea of isolating the fundamental categories bringing them up up to the thought in themselves is very important one philosophy for Hegel begins with the fundamental determinations of thought are explicitly treated not only used you could spend a whole life establishing causal links between things and never think about causality itself very true uh, and that's one of the things that uh, still differentiates human consciousness from even the highest animal consciousness. You know, there are animals in which we seem to find that they have some notion, uh, you know, that veers seeming, some people want to say it veers close to what seems to be conceptual understanding. Uh, but uh, even if we gave credence to that even if they have conceptual understanding of some sort it is not the kind of conceptual understanding that we humans have because we humans have uh, that conceptual understanding of concepts themselves we can conceive of concepts as concepts uh, sure a dolphin may have the concept of causality that it can use you know it can understand it through that but the dolphin cannot have a concept of the concept of causality. Let's keep going. Where was I? Um, continuing. Quote, in so many respects, quote, says Aristotle in the same context, quote, is human nature in bondage, but this science which is not pursued for any utility is alone free in and for itself, and for this reason it appears not to be a human possession, unquote. Philosophical thinking in general still deals with concrete subject matters, with God, nature, spirit, but logic occupies itself exclusively with these thoughts as thought in complete abstraction by themselves. Just now, the quip on that. Uh, this has always been interesting to me in that uh, philosophy, as such, since this very uh, conception, uh, has been generally in the West considered to be utterly and completely useless. Uh, so, you know, the question of like, why should I study philosophy is sort of a weird question. Uh, indeed, why? You know, if you're asking, the main reason people ask is because they want some sort of functional reason. You know, it's got to have some function in my life. Uh, you know, I'm going to be able to use it for something, right? Except uh, you won't. There's nothing to use it for. It's a it's an understanding of the world, the satisfaction of understanding, and that's about it. Uh, at least initially, that's about it. Uh, I think there ends up being uh, uses for it, practically speaking. Uh, but that's not its primary point. That's sort of a contingent thing. Uh, and it's not so much contingent as sort of a, it's a secondary effect, so to say. Uh, spirit, uh, 
Mench says, this is the third time, the third time purpose of philosophy was brought today in this session. Uh, there is absolutely, there absolutely is a purpose and it is to achieve absolute spirit and self-recognition in the other. This is blessedness. Uh, I agree, but at the outset, we cannot say there is a purpose. You know, that's just kind of the logic. You know, what is the purpose of the logic? Well, we don't know. Uh, you know, until we get to the end of it, then we know the purpose. Uh, CDC 11 says, uh, why study philosophy? Because it's the only discipline capable of dealing with normativity and being able to re be responsible for its own method and object, as you shall see in the beginning of the first introduction. The spirit continues, this is the whole point of our conversation today, or any conversation on Hegel. He says it repeatedly in all sections of the encyclopedia. Uh, yes, Hegel says essentially the whole point is, the whole point is freedom. You know, uh, and freedom ends up meaning a lot. Uh, which is a very, a very modern thing, of course, you know. Uh, of course, everything's about freedom, you know, uh, especially in the West. Like, that's, that is... Uh, unquestionably the conclusion which is unique to the West, which is not there in any other philosophy tradition. It's not in the Indian, and it's not in the Chinese. The end point of all of those is not freedom. Uh, for a lot of those, the end point is a sort of like, you know, uh, a kind of freedom, but it's not freedom as such. Uh, it, it's still an, intu an intuitive, lived thing to do with finite considerations, and it's not to do really with infinite considerations uh, in a concrete sense. Sure, you know, for example, in Indian tra the Indian, tra Indian tradition, uh, enlightenment is a, a concept which is supposedly about freedom, uh, but it's only about a negative kind of freedom. It's supposed to be about freedom from this world, freedom from the issues of finitude, freedom from the mess of the contradictions of existence. And uh, in Chinese philosophy, there's also the concept of freedom, but it's still a finite kind of freedom, a limited kind of freedom. Whether in Taoism you have something very similar to the kinds of freedom of uh, both the Indian uh, absolutely negative kind of the otherworldly, but there's also a freedom in these the this worldly kind of sense in which the freedom is a sort of freedom from inhibition, freedom from um, you know arbitrary regulation, freedom of things just to be as they are, uh, you know, in their natural state. Uh, but it's not a, a fully human freedom. It's not a freedom that is truly positive in the sense of a purpose. Uh, and with the Western notion of freedom, I think that we have something that's on a completely different level in which freedom is freedom not for this universal entity called the Brahman, God, the Tao, uh, whatever it may be, being, but freedom is really the freedom of the individual, your freedom. The ultimate purpose of the world is your freedom, not the freedom of like some otherworldly thing uh, of which you are you know, somehow alien to and you don't matter. Uh, but the meaning of your freedom is an entire world of freedom. It's an entire world in which uh, there are limitations, in which there are determinations, in which there are actual things that determine you to only specifications in which you must become specifically someone and something. Uh, spirit comments. Uh, it makes life intrinsically meaningful and enjoyable. Well said on freedom, AW. To clarify, we don't mean to end the end of as abstract freedom or negation, but general, real genuine freedom or spirit or the sublation of abstract caprice and necessity as destiny. These conversations we are having on the logic are to help us achieve our collective destiny. Um, he also mentions on one, one of my comments. He says uh, that is not exactly true. Uh, AW, true freedom is of the individual and the universal through the particular. Uh, yes, I agree. Uh, it's the individual through the universal. But um, the reason I'm, I'm putting the emphasis on the individual uh, is mainly because uh, a lot of people seem to have this understanding that Hegel is this kind of person who doesn't actually care about individuality. You know, spirit is this 
overall thing over us and you know to be free we have to get with the program with it you know like that's our freedom and that that notion of freedom is actually before hegel as well you know that's sort of the um the old platonic idea and, and rationalist idea that you know somehow you know like freedom is knowing your place and that you know even if it goes against your personal desires even if it goes against you know the individual things that you want to do you know uh, you should consider your freedom to only be that the rational freedom which uh, before hegel was only the freedom of that universal uh with hegel we finally get a universal in which uh uh, the freedom of the universal is also your freedom. And it's not that you get with the program of the universal. Uh, rather, when you really understand yourself, when you really come to like be yourself and cognizant of yourself, cognizant of what it is to be free, your individual desires will be revealed to actually be in accord with the universal reason. Uh, insofar as you know uh, you're an actually functional human being uh, there's many ways in which your individual desires can be against your own desire for other desires uh, so you know for example so somebody who suffers from like some kind of like a, a brain malfunction that causes depression uh, and you know they have obsessive depressive thoughts well that person clearly has depressive desires but their rational side, you know, desires to not be depressed, desires to not be thinking about dying or whatnot. Uh, and so, you know, can they align through the sheer knowledge of the concept and their will, you know, their desires with the universal? Well, of course not. There's the natural, there's a natural barrier right there. Uh, so problems can arise between you, individuals actually being able to really fully align themselves. But for the vast majority of us, there is that reality that is possible. Uh, so, you know, uh, if, if one asks Hegel, what is the purpose of life? Hegel says, well, the purpose is to be free. Uh, and he says, well, what free, you know, what is freedom? And Hegel would answer, well, it depends on what your own personal desires and goals are in the context of a society. You know, if you're an artsy person, then your freedom is going to be an artist um, you know what art you end up creating is up to the contingencies of your own personal life and whatnot uh, but then that comes back to the unity of the whole you know you give back to society something uh, in which society produces the conditions of your freedom both intellectually as well as materially and then you through your own freedom create the conditions of other people's freedoms you know because if you're an artist and you create uh, an artwork uh, somebody somewhere, not only not only do you satisfy your own desires and needs, but this has universal significance for other people. You know, other people will consume your artwork. Other people will enjoy your artwork. Other people will recognize themselves through your artwork. Other people will recognize society through your artwork. Um, so these individual pursuits become universal pursuits at one and the same time. Uh, spirit says it is that when your own your own is social reason your own uh, uh, social reason understands the necessity of the universal that it is the only affirmative freedom uh, reason is a link if the reason is lacking and the individual must obey necessity then this oppression this is oppression on freedom uh, yes you have to be self-conscious about it you know you can't just do it but you have to be self-conscious of how you do it and what why you do it and wh what you're doing so i think that's enough of that tangent where was i um, so philosophical thinking in general still deals with c concrete subject matters with god nature spirit but logic occupies itself exclusively with these thoughts as thought in complete abstraction by themselves for this reason it is customary to reserve it for the instruction of youth for youth is not yet involved in the practical affairs of concrete life but lives a life of leisure so far as these are concerned and it is only for its own subjective ends 
that it has to busy itself acquiring at that level of theory at least the means that will eventually enable it to become actively engaged in the object of this practical interest. Contrary to Aristotle's view just mentioned, the science of logic is counted among these means. The study of its of it is a preliminary labor and its place is the school, while the seriousness of life and the active pursuit of substantial ends of left for later. In real life, it is then a matter of making use of the thought determinations. From the honor of being contemplated for their own sake, such determinations are debased to the position of serving in the creation and exchange of ideas required for the hustle and bustle of social life. They are in part used as abbreviations because of their universality. Indeed, what an infinite host of particulars relating to an external existence and to action are summed up in a, are summed up in a representation, for instance, of battle, war, nation, or of sea and animal, etc. And also, what an infinite host of images, actions, situations, etc., are epitomized in the representation of God or of love, etc., epitomized in the simplicity of this way of representing. In part, they are also used for the closer specification and discovery of objective relations, but in this role, the content and the purpose of the thought involved, its correctness and truth, are made to depend entirely on the given data. And the thought determinations are not themselves credited with any active function in the in the determination of content. The use of thought determinations that we earlier called natural logic is unconscious, and when in science this role of serving as means is reflectively attributed to them, then thinking as such is made subordinate in the life of spirit to the other spiritual activities. So, just a quick remark on uh, what Hegel says about school and logic. Uh, just, just imagine somebody a.k.a. Hegel, who actually did this, teaching high schoolers the science of logic. Uh, at least in the way that it's written, it's not going to go down well. <laughs> uh, but it actually makes perfect sense, actually, that um, ideally speaking, this properly would be something that should be taught to people as they're growing up. Uh, you would... Instead of learning this, you know, like you learn it in a, a philosophy course, say in a year, uh, you would ideally be learning this over the entire course of your childhood education from, you know, primary all the way to like end of high school. You know, when you take 12 years to develop this in far deeper and far more concretely rich, rich detail, uh, something like the science of logic should not at all be very difficult at all. You know, 12 years, spread, spread this book out in 12 years, you can totally do it. Uh, especially when, you know, it's just a few concepts a year, basically. You know, every single year you, you learn a new concept to operate with. Uh, and many concepts can be learned uh, at once, actually, because they're not, they're not that advanced. Uh, many times one concept structure is good enough for, like, five or ten concepts you know it gives you the thought movement necessary to get that going so something like this uh, if it could be ever put into a cur curriculum uh would be very easy uh practically speaking and it would go very well with an actually naturalized way of teaching in which rather than working through formal rote memorization uh, and uh, formal structures of reasoning uh, you would be working with actual hands-on things and real concrete problem solving uh, because that's what thinking ultimately is uh, in its functional operative aspect. You know, what you do with thinking, what thought really is, is the very process of problem solving. Uh, it's not this definition game. It's thinking through content. So, ideally, uh, you know, in a perfect world where we had a, an actual state of right, uh, someday, <laughs> someday somebody will cook up some curriculum in which, like, uh, this book is uh, made uh, far more accessible over a far broader stretch of time. And uh, people will just find it utterly, banally ordinary. Uh, and uh, you'll, you'll see what I mean uh, once we get uh, through the first chapter. Because uh, once you see how it functions, the moment it clicks, you'll be like, wow, uh, 
how how could I never have thought about this? All right, continuing. Um, we do not intend to, uh, to do, uh, what was it? All right, let me start with the prior sentence. Uh, the use of thought determinations that we either we earlier called natural logic is unconscious. And when in science this role of serving as means is reflectively attributed to them, then thinking as such is made subordinate in the life of spirit to the other spiritual activities. We do not indeed say of our feelings, impulses, interests that they serve us. On the contrary, they count as independent forces and powers so that to have this particular feeling, to desire and to will this particular thing, to make this our interest, just this is what we are. And it is more likely that we become conscious of obeying our feelings, impulses, passions, interests, not to mention our habits, than of having them in our possession, still less in view of our intimate union with them, of their being means at our disposal. Such, ter such determinations of mind and spirit, when contrasted with the universality which we are, con which we are conscious of being, and in which we have our freedom, quickly show themselves to be particulars, and we rather regard ourselves to be caught up in their particularities and to be dominated by them. It is all the less possible, therefore, to believe that the thought determinations that pervade all our representations, whether these are purely theoretical or hold a material belonging to sensation, impulse, will, that such thought determinations are at our service, that it is, that it is we who have them in our possession and not they who have us in theirs. What is there more, what is there more, eh, what is there of more in us as against them, how would we, how would I set myself up as the superior universal over them, they that are the universal as such, when we give ourselves up to a sensation, a purpose, an interest, and feel restricted therein, feel unfree, then the place where we can withdraw from it back into freedom is this area of self-certainty, of pure abstraction, of thought. Or again, when we speak of things, we call their nature. Actually, hold on there. So that little section right there is pretty significant, uh, I think. That that tells you something about uh, something that's not going to come up very much uh, in what we read in the actual theoretical text, uh, but it's something that lies in the background of it. And this concerns a lot of the stuff about, like, well, uh, what's the problem with idealism, right? Uh, idealism is a big spooky word. It's a it's a spook term nowadays. Nobody wants to be called an idealist. Uh, you know, every like something like ninety percent of, of philosophers in analytic philosophy are physicalists, which are just like uh, pathetic materialists that uh, don't want to define what matter is. <clears throat> and um, even in the uh, continental tradition, uh, a lot of people just want to call themselves materialists now, even though they have no care at all to talk about something called matter. Uh, because idealism is just a spooky word. You know, uh, <clears throat> uh, Hegel does identify thought and being, or what you would might, might want to call matter in some form, um, as one and the same thing in essence. The, or rather, like Hegel would actually want to say the, what he said here, the real essence of things is thought. Uh, you know, it's not that matter and thought share the same essence. No, thought is the essence of matter. You know, thought is the essence of all these other things that we consider in the world. Uh, particularly here, his point about like, why is it that we have this strange understand, this strange belief today that we think our thoughts rather than the opposite uh, or, you know, we have our thoughts rather than that thoughts have us. Um, and it's mainly because we have this uh, experience in which we think that we are the originators of thought because we can will to draw thought up to consciousness, uh, you know, on command. You know, somebody says, oh, think of this. You're like, okay. And you're like, I thought of that. You know, I'm the one who makes the thoughts happen. The thoughts don't just happen by themselves. I think them. That's why they're thoughts. And Hegel says, well, no, you know, if you actually pay attention to the way we actually live and the way we end up understanding things, we are entirely caught up in unconscious thoughts 
all the time, everywhere, with no exceptions whatsoever. You know, uh, the idea of just like walking into a store and paying for something with money is an unconscious thought. You know, you operate with these thoughts. The idea that, you know, you think that there's a value to your time and that you think about this in monetary terms is a thought that con constitutes the very way you live. You don't have this thought. This thought has you. <laughs> you know, the idea of, say, romantic love, you know, that you grow up with that just constitutes the way in which you think about what romance should be and how you are supposed to experience romance and that when it happens you're kind of caught off guard because the real thing or you know the thing that empirically happens to you happens to not align with it or happens to align with it you know and then you somehow you, you feel that this is wrong you know you feel that you know that somehow the person you fell in love with you know failed you know to to give you the real thing you know they didn't really love you because you have this unconscious notion of love you know uh it's like being white in the united states you know you're caught up in these thoughts even though even when they're not in your head you know whiteness is not just a thing in your head but it's an actual structural dynamic operation in the real world which runs its course throughout your life which benefits you and builds you without you ever realizing it without you ever having a consciousness of this thought uh, the thoughts like causality, for example, uh, or thoughts that have you. Uh, so, um, uh, Schelling has a, a phrase somewhere in the uh, the essay on freedom uh, where he mentions this. Hegel's not the first one to mention this strangeness, that it is so bizarre that we think we are in control of thought when it's completely the opposite. You know, all these things that are just the fundamental things, the dogmas that we have, that we just believe uh, unconsciously, they're thoughts that possess us. You know, we, we operate under their rules uh, in the same way that matter operates under the laws of gravity. <laughs> uh, it's a very bizarre thing. And one of the things we're going to find when we hit the ground running with being and nothing and becoming is that there really is an objectivity to thoughts that has nothing to do with our subjective will. Thoughts are not the subjective products of our will. Uh, in, in a very strange way, thoughts literally think themselves. Uh, I see some of you want to comment. <coughs> so... Uh, <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, Spirit uh, says, but contingency is part of our own thoughts as separate and the other to the pure thoughts of the idea. So we are the freedom of the idea from itself as we return to it through our finite knowledge as it approaches infinity again through the completion of the logic. <clears throat> uh, Dan asks, what is the relationship then between unconscious thought versus conscious thought if thought thinks itself? Uh, to uh, attempt to give a rudimentary, vague answer that requires far more detail than uh, I got time to give, uh, Dan. <laughs> uh, the relationship is that um, the regular thoughts that we think under our will are just contingent thoughts. Um, and uh, in many ways, we can say this, that we can make a, a proper judgment that these are not thoughts at all. You know, these thoughts that we bring up before consciousness on command as abstractions, as definitions, are not actually thoughts. Uh, yeah, they're literally what, what Kant would call representations because that's what they are. They are representations of thoughts. The actual thoughts that go on in your head are those things that actually are processes of cognition. You know, when you're doing a math problem, you're thinking one plus one is two. And you're like, you're like one, two, two. Okay, it's two. That's a thought process. That's a real thought. That's a concept that's going on. The mere regurgitation of representations is not a real thought itself. Um, so a lot of thoughts that we have are not actually thoughts at all. You know, if you say, like, if, uh, you, uh, if I ask you what day Napoleon was born on, and you say, oh, like, let me think that right up. You're not actually thinking that, you know. <laughs> uh, 
uh, you're bringing up a representation, but it's not an actual thought itself. Uh, and actually, Hegel mentions this in the uh, preface of the Phenomenology of Spirit, where he says, like, uh, a lot of what we consider knowledge has no, no actual relationship to knowledge at all. It's merely contingent little uh, bits and pieces of uh, uh, social trivia in so many ways, uh, which has no objective validity, neither in a conceptual sense, nor in the worldly, worldly sense. You know, the fact that we are at the year 2021 has no objective meaning whatsoever. Uh, it's a, an in, a contingent and completely arbitrary thing of how we decide to date things has no objectivity whatsoever, neither as a concept nor as uh, a fact of the world. Uh, dense uh, ask what you said about continuously makes a lot of sense so conscious thought is a thought already thought kind of uh, yes Dan I uh, will actually will will find that uh, all thoughts already are thought uh, it's like they were always complete by the time by the time we get to it and we realize it it's like they were always already th finished <laughs> it's a very weird thing uh, because we find that in thinking them even though we're not conscious of the completeness they have, we are operating with that completeness. Um, CDC 11 says, and there's also this contingency is not only a matter of the ideas themselves, but of the exposition also. Right, right. So in many ways, uh, another thing to, to bring up there is, uh, just sort of to bring it back to what we, what we were discussing, um, thoughts, just like feelings, are and are not ourselves, depending on like how we're relating to them at, on a, any given moment, right? You know, uh, my feelings are clearly part of me. They're not alien to me. They're not other to me. They're not impositions on me until they are. <laughs> You know, sometimes you have feelings, you have desires, and you don't want to have them. You know, there's a, there's a contradiction between desires and desires, between a rational desire and those intuitive desires. Uh, and Hegel mentions it here that, uh, isn't it weird that we find that the only place we find our freedom is when we can step away from these intuitions and drives and feelings into thought. So, you know, clearly clearly there is something very special about the relationship of freedom and thought itself the fact that we find our freedom in stepping on back in stepping away and stepping against and over these feelings that we have which we experience as alien to us in many ways in certain moments uh, the fact that that is the one place that we can go where like we find that we still remain ourselves is a very very interesting thing Um, to go over a little something that I underlined here, he um, says, such determinations of mind and spirit when contrasted with the universality which we are conscious of being. Um, something interesting about consciousness, yes, just our own self-consciousness, all consciousness really, is it's a universal. Like, literally, it's a universal. Like, everything comes in into and under your consciousness everything concepts the intuitive world of the senses everything is in of and through your consciousness your consciousness is the one thing that unifies it and makes it differentiable and understandable at all but consciousness is not the universal it's a it's a universal but it's not the universal. The universal is pure thought itself. Uh, there, there are some people who want to think that Hegel has uh, is a, a typical idealist of, you know, what I would call just conscious ide idealism, 
which is uh, most of what you find in uh, Indian philosophy, for example, that uh, uh, everything is consciousness, everything uh, has this sort of like self-intuition. Um, there, there are these feelings that are endemic to it, like uh, I think like in India, it's uh, Sat Chitananda, which is consciousness, bliss, and uh, I forget what the third one is. Uh, but Hegel is not that kind of person. For Hegel, the, the the ultimate unifier is not even this perceptive apparatus we have, and you know the window to the world. So, for example, the ultimate unifier is the self, which is thought itself. Um, it's the universal. Uh, City says, uh, "Think about how consciousness is able to bring up any content whatsoever, and in a sense, to become these contents." Uh, city, uh, it is funny. Think about it. What other known object is able to present any object whatsoever within itself? Thought is the universal. Exactly. So, you know, when Hegel speaks of, um, later on, he says stuff about the, the concept. Uh, you are the concept. You know, the concept is thought, but you are thought as well. You know, and... Uh, not only that, not only is it the case that oh, you are you yes, you might say like yes, I am thought in that way, but you know I'm a finite thought. No, it, it comes out to be you are the concept. No, no distinction. You know you are that infinite universal. Uh, Dan asks, should we think of ourselves as both conduit and free being? Conduit for thought? Um, uh, not, not precisely. Uh, conduit would not be really a, a proper word. I, I don't like that whole, uh, that kind of language that uh, some people use about, uh, you know, us being conduits for the idea. Uh, Dan says, I'm just trying to think about uh, of what we mean by we become thought. Uh, we don't become thought. You are thought. Uh, and you're thought in various, various ways. And uh, initially, yes, this sounds us absolutely weird and bizarre. Um, once, once we get a, a definition of idealism, uh, which happens at the end of the first chapter and the end of the second chapter with... A typical notion that people have that oh well you know this is some kind of like this is in God's mind or something right that the world exists as God's thoughts there is a way in which that makes sense but it hasn't it's not primarily idealism of consciousness it's not a representational idealism like our own consciousness in many ways works like uh, and it's it's not really analogous ultimately uh, our mind is analogous, but, you know, the way we experience ourselves with, like, you know, these compartmentalizations of brains and imagination and whatnot uh, is not analogous to the way you would say uh, it's kind of wrong to say the mind of God because God just is the mind. You know, it's not even a mind or of mind, but it's just mind, uh, which doesn't mean anything except for like that which is self-contained internally and internally self-constituted determining that's what a mind is for hegel you know the difference between mind and nature is literally nature is other determined externally mind is inner determined internally and mind internalizes even that exteriority so mind is just the absolute final standpoint <laughs> you know spirit is is the absolute final standpoint because it's it's the it's the interiority to which externality is interior to. Uh, Spirit says you are and you are not the notion. Very true. Uh, Hyperion says uh, thoughts express themselves through us individually in rational ways, according to who we are, subjective persons. Otherwise, it would be unordered, chaotic thought, passive being, rather than real thinking, active being. I agree.
Let me see how much more do we have to finish this. So let me finish up reading this paragraph and we will leave it off at 2115 for next time. All right, where was I? Okay, continuing. Or again, when we speak of things, we call their nature or essence their concept. And this concept is only for thought, but still less shall we say of the concepts of things that we dominate them, or that the thought determinations of which they are, the complex, are at our service. On the contrary, our thought must accord with them, and our choice or freedom ought not to want to fit them into its purpose. Thus, inasmuch as subjective thought is our own most intimately inner doing, and the objective concept of things constitutes what is essential to them, we cannot step away from this doing, cannot stand above it, and even less can we step beyond the nature of things. We can, however, dispense with this last claim. Inasmuch as it is symmetrical with the one preceding it, it says that our thoughts have a reference to the essence of things. But this is an empty claim, for the essence of things would then be set up as the rule for our concepts, whereas for us, that, e that essence can only be the concepts that we have of the things. The way in which critical philosophy understands the relation of the three termini is that we place thoughts as a medium between us and the things, in the sense that this medium, instead of joining us with such things, would rather cut us off from them. But this view can be countered by the simple remark that these same things that are supposed to stand at the opposite extreme beyond us and beyond the self-referring thoughts are themselves things of thought, which, taken as entirely indeterminate, are only one thing, the so-called thing in itself, the thought produ product of pure abstraction. Dan says this period of probably the best articulated response to Kant. <laughs> I think he gets better ones, but it's a, it's a pretty good one if you're, if you're familiar with Kant. Uh, but yeah, that one's pretty straightforward. Uh, there's no justification for this here. The justification happens as we go through the logic and as well, uh, part of it comes about in the phenomenology of spirit. Uh, but you know, when he says, uh, when we speak of things, we call their nature or essence, their concept. And this concept is only for thought. Uh, you know, uh, many of you would probably respond to this for like, uh, I don't call the nature and essence of things their concept, <laughs> you know? Uh, it's not part of my regular lexicon. What are you talking about? Uh, of course not. And I don't think most people in even Hegel's days actually said that. Uh, but uh, it so happens to be that the essence or nature of things is their concept because what we have as that nature or essence is a concept. Uh, you know, we say, oh, the, the essence of the world of appearances that we have is really physics. You know, physics is matter. So it's just matter and forces. There's no such thing you will ever grab as matter as such. Nobody has ever encountered. Nobody will ever touch it. Nobody will ever touch force as such. Nobody will grasp it. Hell, nobody can grab force unless you believe along with, <laughs> you know, the people who believe in the current fundamental theory of particles that there are force particles uh, in which you can indeed grab gravity. Uh, but, you know, we've never done so and I don't think we ever will. Um, regardless of that, uh, the, I mean, you can't get away from it. The concept we have of what is the nature or essence of anything is indeed an immaterial, ideal concept. Uh, we may play around that we're, we're talking about a thing out there that is the objective world that is a tangible thing. But the essence of all things that are tangible happens to entirely be non-tangible ideal concepts. You know, uh, even even look at something like, what is the essence of a human being? Well, what is the essence of a human being? Uh, even if you're an empiricist, what you see is something, and what you're going to respond with is literally something intang intangible. You know, uh, you have sensations, then you have a representation about sensations. That representation you call experience. That in itself is just a concept, and you say, oh, experience is the essence of, of you know, the entire world. 
you know there's nothing there's nothing but experience well experience is not an object you can grab it's not a thing in the world it's a concept it's an idea uh, you may want to say oh well you know the essence of an apple is uh you know this chemical thing in dna it's you know some kind of dna code for example uh, and then you ask well well sure that's an, an object in the world but uh you know, is that really the essence? Isn't there a further essence? They're like, well, yeah, you know, the DNA is uh, constituted by these chemical forces, which we don't understand, uh, constituted by this stuff called matter, which we also don't understand. And, you know, ultimately, well, the, the real essence of, you know, anything, you know, whether an apple, a baseball, a dog, uh, us, our brains, uh, ends up being these abstract things that exist nowhere uh, as such. So, you know... Uh, it seems initially weird to say, oh, well, the essence of everything is concepts. But the truth of the matter is that practically speaking, what we do every single time we talk about essences and uh, natures and the real things is always and inescapably concepts. No matter how you spin it, no matter what you call it, no matter how you want to so badly say it's not, so much as you want to be Lacan and say it's the real man, you know, you just have the symbolic, but, you know, it is the real. The real is, like, the essence of all things. Uh, but the real is what? It's a concept in Lacan's head. It's a concept in my head. It's a concept in your head. We'll never touch the real. The real is behind all the appearances. It's doesn't ex it literally does not exist. It exists only as an intangible, ideal, unempirical concept. Uh, CDC 11 says, matter is a damn incredible abstraction. <laughs> Indeed. Uh, Hegel has a great comment on that in chapter 1. But all right. Um, we're going to leave it there. Uh, some of you seem to want to comment, so I'll still uh, leave this running for to read those comments. But beyond that, we'll leave this here for the next time. And next time we'll... Uh, finish this up and uh, get started on the uh, first introduction, which is the, the general concept of logic. Uh, Sidious comments, there's nothing outside of thought. The insistence on that actually marks the departure of many contemporary philosophers from Hegel. It is fashionable to affirm that there is an absolute difference which cannot be thought, but that's only a claim, a thoughtful one at that. Uh, indeed, uh, the very like Hegel actually brings this up in the the phenomenology spirit as well as in logic, which is the very notion of the division of the world between minds and reality, between subjectivities and objectivities, between your symbolic and real, is a product originated in thought, by thought, and for thought, and has no reality beyond thought. There is no real world out there that objectively pre-exists that you can think of that is going to be outside any possible conception. There is no trans-conceptual thought, uh, despite how many people want to say there is. Um, I think that people who say that just don't understand what that means. Um, there's people, who, you know, mostly you'll find mystics saying this. Uh, <laughs> funny enough, that's dominant strain until now. Now it's a rational, sober uh, you know, materialists and empiricists who are saying this, uh, which is, you know, there, there is no knowledge that is not conceptual knowledge. There is no knowledge that is actually beyond concepts. Uh, you know, you may say that, oh, well, you know, I experienced a five-dimensional domain in which, you know, there's, there's just more than thought, man. You know, there's a knowing that's, that's just like more than thought. But that's not really true because that falls right back under thought. Thought, because it's, it's, it's universal, can particularize and individualize and instantiate anything within itself, absolutely anything at all. It doesn't matter what intuitions, doesn't matter what dimensions, doesn't matter what domains, what realms, it will all fall right back under thought. The only thing that you could say would be a limitation is the empirical notion of certain uh, phenomena. You know, uh, that's about it. That is the only limitation you could possibly have within our capacity to think anything.
you know indeed you know we're three-dimensional beings there might be four-dimensional beings so we cannot experience the four dimension fourth dimension in four-dimensional space or whatever it might be so we might be limited in our capacity to intuitively comprehend how such a world or realm works or imagine that some kind of beings exist that have uh, experiential intuitions that we don't have you know they see colors that we don't see uh, they they have feelings that we don't feel uh, that's still not something beyond thought you know if we had access to that dimension we would immediately be able to cognize something about it and start developing a concept of it uh, and if some of those beings described it to us in a conceptual way which all things can be done no matter what one wants to say about it uh, we would be able to comprehend it even though we wouldn't be able to like sympathize or empathize with it you know they have an emotion that we don't or they see a color, color we don't nonetheless we could understand the sort of conceptual relationships that that has with the rest of the world Uh, Dan asks, does Derrida inadvertently prove Hegel right by his claim of nothing outside the text? Um, um, sort of, that, that sort of kind of goes with that. Uh, CDC 11 says, there is a fear of logocentrism, which itself is based on the use and abuse of non-scrutinized categories, which are employed non-critically. I agree. Uh, Dan continues, um, Yes, but what about Levinas' idea about another person always being beyond totally knowing them, beyond a totality? Uh, I just don't agree with Levinas. Levinas' obsession with the other, I think, is not true and very dangerous if you take it tr seriously. While Levinas try spins it in a very good way, there's a very dark way to spin that. Um, and because it is only a fragmentary like view of the world... Uh, there's a way to justify the dark side of Levinas's metaphysics uh, in a way that you cannot really justify the, a dark side of Hegelianism uh, in the same way. Sidis uh, 11 says, what can I say to Levinas? He offers nothing to support his own conception of totality as being, as pure passivity in the manner of Heidegger. Honestly, I don't think Levinas is serious philosophy. He is a brilliant writer. Totality and infinity is a touching book, but offers no account of their basic categories. Levinas is a philosophy of pure passivity, of ultimate slavery. Uh, I, I have to concur with that about any uh, philosophy of otherness, that all philosophies of otherness are you ultimately... I won't say that they're ultimately passive, uh, but they're definitely ultimately slavish. Uh, they're ultimately fragmentary, very lonely philosophies, and very dangerous uh, for the atomizing power that they have. I mean, just just a sort of commentary side note on that. Uh, there was a, a while in which I had a a long running dialogue with a Levinasian, uh, and uh, I just could not get through to him that you know he could not impose. He wanted to understand Hegel, but he kept imposing Levinas's understanding of categories on Hegel, and I, I kept telling him, "You can't do that." You know, uh, if you're going to study not just Hegel but any philosopher, you you have to go with their thoughts, their concepts at their word and as they're defining things. You can't keep uh, bringing up external considerations until the argument is done. You know, uh, it's not to say that you have to buy the argument that Hegel's making uh, hook, line, and sinker, but you have to let Hegel say the entirety of his piece before you go and say, okay, now, you know, let me poke holes in it. Because, you know, if you're poking holes in things before they're finished, you're never going to see the whole picture in which like, you might realize, oh, these things that I had uh, as comebacks, you know, were they either relevant, they were, they were ultimately relevant, or they were irrelevant, or maybe they weren't relevant the way I thought they were. Uh, Dan asks, uh, you mean in being in debt to the other as slavery? I'm not here to defend Levinas or even claim to know his work. Well, I've only read sl snippets of... Uh, Totality and infinity. Um, 
Now, I, I don't think uh, Lebanon's whole thing about, you know, uh, us being in debt to the other and like always, uh, you know, being an, unable to uh, overcome this uh, kind of debt to them is, is the slavish part so much as uh, the fact that we, we can never come to our own in Lebanon, it seems, that we can never come and we can never get rid of this alienation. We can never, uh, you know, feel whole in this world, you know. Nobody can ever know us, and we can never know anybody. We cannot know God, and God is so far beyond us that you know we're nothing to God. Um, it's just uh, it's a it's a it's a dark philosophy in many ways, uh, in my opinion. Uh, then comments. I always come back to these guys and Hegel because I've yet to be truly, I've yet to be as truly convinced. But I can't help but ask questions to satisfy my own curiosity and to hopefully increase my understanding. Uh, oh, be as truly convinced by other thinkers. Uh, Cities 11 says, Ronnie, when we begin with these, the first introduction, I think you will understand the radicality of Hegelian philosophy. It is a philosophy of absolute freedom, of not accepting anything on unjustified authority, not even the conception of our most rudimentary categories. Spirit says, the interesting thing to consider is the nature of sensuousness as the pure other of the idea. Sensuousness is thought that is not thought, radical contingency. But Hegel does say that even matter is just pure attraction and repulsion together simultaneously. So sensuousness is thought that isn't always governed by it, but what is governing it, but what is governing it when it's not idea? It still returns to itself as pure thought, but it is interesting that this is likely the closest we can get to unthought. That is thought, and why Marx was able to perform the dialectic trick of saying he turned Hegel on his head and still remained consistent, even without starting with the pure logic, but rather dialectical materialism. Materialism, abstract nature. Hmm. Uh, yeah, uh, I would say that uh, uh, there, there's um, a lot of people who uh, make a big deal about the, the weirdness of like, how do we relate nature ultimately to the idea uh, and in many ways i think it's kind of obvious uh you know when hegel says what's well, the idea in otherness you know the idea is not idea or the idea is not thought uh yeah i mean it's it's idea objectified the like you know the way nature works is that nature is the out the outsidedness of everything you know whereas thought is the Total insightedness in the logic. Uh, nature is the complete opposite. So the way things behave in nature is mechanically, objectively, um, and uh, nonetheless, in doing so, the very fact that nature has naturing, that it's structured, that that you can actually determine anything about it, makes it undeniably <laughs> thought which is objectively existent in the form of objects. Um, you know, the ways in which sensuousness appears to us, I think that's kind of like one of the mystifying things about consciousness where people mistake consciousness to be sensuousness or the experience of sensuousness. And, you know, like uh, in analytic philosophy, it's this whole talk about quiddities and qualia and, you know, what it's like to be... And, you know, people are, keep trying to get at consciousness in this way. Uh, and it's like trying to, like, get at what is, what is nature by, you know, just grabbing an object and just going like uh, this. You know, it's objecting. It's like resisting whatever. You know, it's holding itself apart objectively from me. You know, what is that? You know, I want to know what that is. Um, and they're... They're not satisfied with the concept, even when the concept fully explains it, uh, because they, they they want that sensuousness to be directly the concept, and it is. But they want the concept in your head to also instantiate that objectivity of sensuousness, uh, and obviously that's not going to happen. You know, in order for that to happen, you would have to have what uh, Kant calls intellectual intuition. <laughs> uh, which, uh, theoretically speaking, uh, angels and higher dimensional beings might have, you know, their thoughts are things, you know, intellectual intuition be like, I have the concept of fire in my head, and that's also the object of fire in my hands. Uh, 
that would be that sort of equivalence. Uh, uh, it seems like that's what some people really, really want, and uh, they really can't have it. Uh, not here, anyways. Some people seem to have to have a pretty good side of that and having a really good imagination. But what they want is like, you know, if I think about fire, I don't just imagine the image of fire, but uh, I want a fire objectively in my ha my hands. Dan says, uh, yes, we can't get rid of this alienation in Lebanon because our own understanding of ourselves is always through and other, the language of the other, etc. Cities 11 uh, comments, I really hope you guys, mostly the beginners, continue to show up to these reading sections. Hegel is still the highest standpoint in philosophy nowadays, and it is rare to find someone so capable as uh, uh, Antonio to honestly expose this amazing text to what it actually is, the biggest text in philosophy since its release. <laughs> well, thank you for uh, the... Uh, Adulations, uh, I appreciate it. Uh, I consider myself a, a nobody in relation in respect to this text, but uh, I mainly do these readings because uh, uh, I, I do like to help other people, and uh, helping other people actually helps clarify things for me as well. So you know, we all we all help each other here in uh, in communicating things, and um, uh, yeah, so. Uh, We'll leave it there. There, um, I'm gonna end the stream, and uh, for those who missed it, uh, hopefully they can catch up with it. So, uh, to those of you who are watching, uh, have a good day, and uh, we'll see you hopefully next week.